Right, thank you very much. Um, and besides being uh, the head of communications for Archimedes Foundation, I am also um, an ambassador of a network called Euraccess, which is <clears throat> why I'm going to tell you a little bit about people and researchers and the reasons why people are maybe afraid to move abroad. Because we, we have all realized here, I suppose, that mobility is actually a good idea, that it is very good for you know, keeping the market competitive and exchanging knowledge. Uh, but if we leave aside um, a few of my colleagues who spoke previously, who obviously have no fear of moving abroad, um, there are actually <clears throat> several reasons why, why there are researchers who might be afraid of moving abroad. And uh, some of these reasons are most probably country-specific, uh, some of them are universal. If we think about the universal reasons, there are, um, most probably there are people who would be afraid of moving out of their culture or the comfort of their own homes or, or leaving their family and uh, you know, personal ties behind. So, so it's, it just takes a certain kind of people to move abroad. And, and on the other hand, uh, when we talk about country-specific things, coming from Estonia, I, I might be the one to know, because well, if you think about learning a foreign language, especially an Estonian language which has uh, 14 cases and 1 million speakers, and has been officially announced as one of the most pointless languages to learn in the world, uh, then, uh, well, I mean, this would be one of the obstacles you might consider when, when you are thinking of moving to Estonia. And if you add a very unattractive climate to that, which is minus 13 at the moment, then um, you might get another obstacle for the country. And uh, taking another thing into account, uh, which is the fact that we are not able to offer competitive salary for most researchers from most countries, then you will get the fact that some, some countries are just a bit worse off than the others. But this is not what I wanted to talk about. What I wanted to talk about was that um, if you take into account all the administrative procedures that people are mostly afraid of when moving to another country, because you are mostly afraid of where can I you know, find health insurance or how do I start a bank account or where shall I put my kids to school and things like that, then uh, Euraccess is the network that is supposed to meet researchers halfway there. Um, Euraccess is a commission found net just to check how many of you know what Euraccess is. Okay, so I will not start from zero, but just for those people who did not raise their hands, I will just in case start from a bit, you know, more basic. So what Euraccess is, is a network of um, 38 countries currently, but it's raising slowly and, and every day. Uh, that has been found by the European Commission and uh, all these countries have uh, services centres in all the major universities which means that if you're a foreign researcher who is going to that university there will be a centre where you will meet somebody who will assist you in, in all these questions, the practical issues that you will meet when, when moving to that country. And um, the good thing is all this is for free because if you, if you go to some you know, other similar services centres in countries, it might be costly. And uh, uh, also before you go, there are national portals of all those countries where you can, first of all, check about all these issues that you might uh, face when moving to that country. And when you combine that to the Euraccess Jobs Portal, which is uh, the place where you can find job offers, well, there's, there's hundreds of research job offers every day in all the countries and in different fields. Um, and there's also a fellowships and grants section, which kind of touches upon what was said earlier here. Um, so basically, why I'm saying all of this is uh, because I believe that Euraccess is a very useful tool for supporting the era. And uh, whenever you go back to your countries and there might be researchers or a discussion on uh, how we could fa facilitate the moving of researchers, then... I just wanted to remember that there, there is a network for that. It's called Euraccess. Thank you. Good, Karen. Thank you very much. Uh, do you find that uh, industries use Euraccess to any great extent? 
Um, actually, this is something we are working on. Uh, all the countries uh, are, are currently having ongoing uh, negotiations with industry in order to post more and more jobs to uh, your access jobs portal. So this is, some countries have picked it up better, some have uh, not picked it up that well yet, but uh, at least this um, you know, introducing the opportunities is, is going on, because the thing is that you, industries can also post their jobs for free, which sure. is different yes. from maybe other portals, similar Good. ones. Now, I've had experience of a number of companies using it with some success. So, uh, right. So. Do, 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 you have a, do you know the number of people using your network? Oh, you can get the number from the computer. How, how many people are using your network? Um, is it very popular? Or how many people know about it? I believe we should ask it from Kitty Ferringer, who is, who is somewhere back there, yes. Uh, hello. <clears throat> I'm the, sort of the coordinated European level of the Euraxis network, and I can say on an annual basis the centers are dealing with around 130,000 questions. One question corresponds to a problem. This is how far we know. So it is quite a tremendous amount of problems that are still hindering mobility within Europe. So you could tell us what the problems are then? <laughs> of course I can. <laughs> um, problems are mainly related to entering the European Union, sort of Europe. It means that most of the problems are related to visa issues followed by accommodation. It is still very difficult for a researcher to find an apartment, a house on probably short-term contracts. And all this, I didn't talk about funding because funding is always the major problem. And all this is uh, then followed by problems related to social security. Um, if I could just touch upon that, uh, for example, in Estonia we have recently had uh, a big issue with Indian researchers who are willing to enter Estonia. And the thing is, you cannot, cannot really come to Estonia on a short-term visa and then start uh, applying for a living permit. Uh, but uh, the thing is, you are supposed to go to your embassy, but unfortunately there is no Estonian embassy in India, which means that they are recommended to go to embassy in China, which is only 4,000 kilometers and one country away. <laughs> um, luckily, there is a positive end to that story. Estonia is opening their embassy in India in, in a very short while. But, uh, but unfortunately, as so far, this is one of the examples of why it is uh, fairly impossible for third country researchers to enter the country sometimes. Any last questions at this point? Any last questions at this point for Karen's presentation? Good. So we'll hold them for the final session. I move on to our last presenter, thank you, Karen, uh, who is Professor Nevin Duick, who is Head of Power Engineering and Energy Management, Chair of the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering, University of Zagreb.